Okay, let's make a start. Um, unaccustomed as I am to public speaking, I need a prompt on this occasion, so forgive me if I... Um, it's an enormous pleasure to welcome you here tonight <coughs> on this very special occasion for all of us, and particularly for Graham. Um, one of the chief reasons that I moved to Imperial College from Oxford 20 years ago was Graham Taylor. For a couple of years, we had previously been um, collaborating on research on the human le leukemia virus, HLV1, about which you'll hear more shortly. But it was increasingly clear that um, Imperial College, and particularly at St. Mary's, was not only the UK leader in research on this infection, but had the potential to become a world leader. <clears throat> um, over this period, Graham has been the perfect collaborator and colleague. He's unfailingly polite, patient, and perspicacious. His interests in research are exactly complementary to mine. This is to his advantage, I should say. The crucial difference is that Graham's underlying aim is to help the patients with these un very unpleasant diseases associated with HLV-1, whereas in my case, it's to understand the underlying biology. And yet, in spite of this difference, every time we write a, a paper, it's always Graham who makes the original and um, uh, observations about the science as well as the clinical aspects, which no one else has spotted. Graham has organized and, and led the National Referral Center for HLV-1 infection for um, more than 10 years now. And he's, rec he's recognized internationally as a leader in both clinical research um, and the management of HTLV-1 and its associated diseases. It's very hard for me to think of anyone who's achieved so much without, so far as I'm aware, making a single enemy. Just, just reflect on that for a moment. We can reach Graham most of the time on his mobile phone, uh, except when he's scuba diving. But it can take uh, quite some time uh, on occasions to get a response from him by email because he's so extraordinarily busy. So, Graham, you are the perfect colleague, but please can you take on slightly less work? <laughs> Graham. And um, I hope you'll bear with me. And part of the title of, in the introduction to this was that it's a, the Meet the Professors um, series. So I've taken that as an excuse to indulge slightly in a little bit of background about which uh, most of you won't be aware. So bear with me at least for the first part of the, of the lecture. So my first three slides are an introduction to the subject they are hopefully um, the detail that you will require to follow some of the um, developments as, as we go along. And so don't think the whole lecture is going to be like this. It's just an introduction to give you a, a basis with which to work. So I'm going to ask uh, what is a retrovirus. We need to understand that viruses are very small. Organisms are tiny, but they, they are not independent. Uh, they require another cell in which to replicate. And when I say they're tiny, I think if my maths is correct, about 10 million viruses, average viruses, would fit on the top of that fingernail. So they are pretty small. And the next thing we need to know about them is that in, in terms of replication, we, we need to understand how that occurs. We have DNA, the genetic code, RNA, the messenger from the DNA to the point where proteins are made. And the right order of things is to have DNA sending instructions through RNA to make proteins. If a virus uses an RNA code 
to make DNA, which was not thought to happen, then it's going the wrong way. And that's why these viruses are called retroviruses, because they have to go backwards from RNA to DNA. A virus coming into contact with a cell will fuse with the cell wall and release its contents into the, into the cell. And this is the viral RNA. And because it's a retrovirus, it's going to make DNA using an enzyme called reverse trans transcriptase. And that DNA will go into the nucleus and become integrated into the genome of one of the, chromos of, of a, one of the cells um, into any particular chromosome. It's fairly random, not completely, but fairly random. And this is a very important point which will crop up again and again in the talk. It can remain there for some time, uh, silently, but will later produce the messenger, and uh, that messenger will produce, uh, lead to the production of proteins and virions that will leave the cell to infect others. And this is the third slide. So this is about transmission, spread of infection. So we're used to the idea that a virus will release um, particles, viral particles from a cell. And these, in the case of a retrovirus, will go and infect other cells. And that integration process that I described will occur in a chromosome. And here in this cartoon, I've illustrated that there are many different places where that will occur. With HTLV-1 in particular, but also with some other retroviruses, we can get proliferation of the infected cell. So that means the cell is dividing. And when it divides, it makes a copy of its DNA. And that DNA now includes the viral DNA. So when it divides, it makes a copy of the viral DNA in exactly the same integration site. And we have two, then four, and so on. And we get an expansion of the infected cell. And this is called uh, a clonal expansion. So I'm going to refer particularly to, to these two, two forms of transmission as we go through the talk. So having uh, given you some background, this is the, uh, the journey that we're going on this evening. I'm going to talk a little bit about the discovery of human retroviruses, which is the background to my talk. I have nothing to do with that. Uh, I am going to talk about how I set out on this particular uh, path. And then there will be four strands of research um, and clinical practice that I'm going to touch on, which I've listed there. In 1975, I took a gap year, and I went to North India, and I spent uh, a happy 11 months there. And w one of the things I was involved with was a community health survey, which involved uh, going out into the communities like these and uh, doing an interview about m uh, maternal and child health and drinking a lot of chai. I went back to India, which was my love of it, five years later on a medical elective. and. Um, got much more involved in the medical practice there uh, in, in a small mission hospital. So whilst I was on my medical elective in 1980, Dr. Robert Gallo was making a major breakthrough in virology. He and his group had detected uh, retroviral particles, which they had obtained from the blood and the white blood cells of a patient in North America who had a particular form of lymphoma invading the skin. And they called this human T lymphotrophic virus. It's sometimes called human T cell leukemia virus. And it's always abbreviated to HTLV. In 1981, I think most of us were becoming aware of the emergence of a new disease, which was given the name acquired immune deficiency syndrome. Otherwise healthy men, usually men, were presenting with infections and rare tumors, rare malignancies, which were associated, particularly the infections, with not having a functionally um, effective immune system. 
So I, like everybody, became aware of this. I was just about to qualify, and, and we all knew about AIDS, but we didn't know the cause. So in 84, the same group, were well, one of the groups to describe the cause, a human retrovirus, which they called HTLV3. I was very excited by this. I was pleased to be able to say what the cause of this disease was. But I didn't bother to ask HTLV3 where was one or two. I was not inquisitive enough. And I have to confess that although I was aware of the adults with AIDS, I hadn't really appreciated that even at that stage, children were presenting with acquired immune deficiency syndrome. And Here's a, the first paper to describe that, even before the organism had been identified. You'll see why this is relevant as I, as I go on. I spent the next five years training in medicine in the UK, in the West Midlands, and then moving to South Wales. And in the summer of 88, there were two major events in my life. The first was the birth of David Luke, at East Glamorgan General Hospital. And six weeks later, we flew halfway across the world where we were warmly welcomed, as you can see, in a place called Honiara. And my job at that time was to be the Chief Medical Officer in Medicine at Number 9, the Central Hospital in Honiara. Just before I left, I noticed this article in the small print of a monthly textbook of medicine in which they linked HTLV-1 with a condition called tropical spastic paraparesis. And uh, this was uh, a, an observation that was made by a, a medical student from France in Martinique um, as part of an investigation of HTLV and leukemia. I didn't think too much more about it until I got to the Solomons. So tropical spastic paraparesis is also known as hglb one associated myelopathy. And because that's a bit of a mouthful, I'm going to refer to it mostly as HAM. And HAM affects adults, usually in the fourth decade of life or later. And it causes stiffness and weakness of the legs. It causes a lot of pain in many patients, particularly low back, and dysfunction of bladder and bowels. I digress for a moment because I have to get my title in. So King Solomon is famed for his wisdom. But in the 16th century, it was his wealth or putative wealth that people were interested in. And Alvaro de Mendana was an explorer who set out uh, from Peru, I believe, looking for new land. And he came across some beautiful islands, uh, volcanic range with some coral atolls, which look idyllic, but were inhabited by a warmongering people. And I give you some advice. These are Nuzu Nuzus. These would have been wooden and attached to the front of the, the war canoe. And if you see the Nuzu Nuzu coming towards you with the head, then you can either flee or fight. If you come with the bird, then they come in peace. And as they were, uh, had a tendency towards cannibalism, it was quite important to know the difference. So Mendana, having found these islands, went back to his funders. And there's a lesson here for all of us. He had a difficult problem to persuade people to fund another expedition. So he enticed them by saying he had found the Solomon Islands. And this is surely where the wealth of King Solomon would lie. So I think it's an excellent bit of grantsmanship. And he did get funded, and he returned to the Solomon Islands some years later. Now, whether or not 
uh, he pointed out to the funders exactly where the Solomon Islands were or where the last sighting of King Solomon might have been is not clear. But they're obviously far apart. And one of the things I liked about my job in the Solomon Islands, apart from the medicine, which was really exciting, was we had to, I say we had to, we had to go on trips to the periphery, to the provincial hospitals, which usually involved a short flight, landing on an airstrip such as this one, hoping that it was clear of the pigs, and then taking a, a journey to a hospital, um, such as this one, doing some ward bounds and uh, trying to help out. On one of these occasions, I also went a little further out into the, one of the clinics. And it was there that I met a man with stiffness in his legs, low back pain, etc. That was the first time I met a patient with ham. And it was because of the interest that already existed in the Solomon Islands, where they knew about HLV-1, and finding a, uh, seeing a patient, that I decided that I would want uh, to start a research program related to HLV-1. So I set about having a database. It's highly sophisticated, and I still have this in a shoebox in my cupboard at home. Um, I collected, oh, these are out of sync. Sorry. Well, maybe I've missed one. Let's go. I've lost one. Oh, sorry. There's a picture missing of a whole load of plasma tubes uh, with, linked to those blood samples. And they then went into an ESCII like this, highly sophisticated refrigeration system. And I attempted to put three of these on this plane as hand luggage. Um, they, they, did, they did take them, but they did put them in the hold. And I had to catch them at Heathrow as they came off the uh, travelator. Now, those samples were to be the start of my research, and we were going to try and look at improving serology um, for, into HGLB1. But in fact, we didn't use them for that in the end. We used them for something else. And uh, with Professor McClure, uh, was investigating another retrovirus, human fomivirus, and we used them to look at the epidemiology of human fomivirus, uh, and that was published a few years later. After three and a half years in the Solomons, I landed back in the UK and turned up at St. Mary's to work on a, an HIV clinical trial funded by the MRC into early, the early, some of the early drugs for treatment of HIV. And I met a young professor of medicine called Professor Weber. And I'm not sure, John, whether you were more surprised or I was. Because I came to you and said, I'd like to do some research on HTLV. And you said, I can't find anybody interested in HTLV. I have been trying for so long. So it was a fairly obviously we were going to get on from, from that moment. And you suggested we set up a, a clinic, which is what you'd been proposing, that I do some lab training, which I'd never done. And we also st started to think about international collaboration. Now, this is 1992. I think by the end of 1992, we'd, you had written uh, a grant to the EU. And we set up the HCLV European Research Network, which was a European concerted action to provide funding to enable collaboration between diverse groups. We had an excellent steering committee, Robin Weiss, uh, Luigi Ciacobianchi, Guy Dutay, and yourself. And they were the brains. I was the brawn. I was the honorary scientific secretary. And um, we quickly went on and started organizing meetings, workshops. And we decided the best approach was English charm. And we would invite our European collaborators to a nice hotel, and we'd have a workshop, and they would love it. And indeed, they did. And this is Great Foster's in, in Egham. And uh, I'll show you later on um, some of the spread of the meetings that we had from that. But the first meeting was about epidemiology. It was about diagnosing 
and counting, if you like. So we wanted to decide a way in which we could make some sense of what was already published about people having HGLV infections and uh, agreed criteria for that to be done. And we, we did that. And then we started to review the literature. And we also got our collaborators to bring some of their unpublished data. And we looked to see how many people might have HGLV. And you can see on this map of the then EU that there were some low levels of, of infection in a, in a number of countries reported. The studies were quite small. They were often quite diverse groups of risk. Sometimes they were amongst injecting drug users. Sometimes they were hospital inpatients. Sometimes they were blood donors who tend to have low risk. And we decided there was a need to look at a more generalized population. So we thought that the best population to look at would be a population of healthy people who attend hospital regularly. They are, of course, pregnant women. And we came up with uh, another grant, further funding, and studied almost a quarter of a million women for HGLV infection across a number of European centers and established a baseline against which future studies could be conducted in Europe to see whether this was changing. So the outcome of that study, well, there were two main observations. One was that amongst the pregnant women, HLV was 10 times more common than amongst blood donors who were selected for having lower risk of infections. And that occurred across the board. It didn't matter which country you were in, the same theme applied. And we were also able to give an estimate to the number of people who carried HGLV infection uh, in Europe at the time. And the UK was second, if you like, in, in total numbers, about 31,000. And if you take that figure, and if I tell you that most people who have HGLV-1 do not develop a disease. About 5% do, and it's the 5% that we'll be thinking about next. Um, in a lifetime of risk, then we're talking about 20 people a year in the UK being diagnosed with HGLV. So what we were really proposing to do was to establish a clinic in London for rare viral diseases. Um, and try to learn as we, could, as we went uh, about these infect infections. So this is just a summary of where we've gone with the European network. It was funded by the EU for about nine years and is now self-funding, and we continue to meet. I think we've had 26 workshops to date, um, and it's been uh, a pleasure to remain part of that. HTLV Clinic was established at St. Mary's with about three patients. Um, not sure what Dr. Hunt would say about that. But, um, but we, 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 we have the clinic every month, I think, to start with. Um, but gradually, more and more patients were referred to us. And our initial idea was just about supporting. People had never heard of HTLV-1. Patients didn't know what it was. Doctors didn't know it was. So um, we wrote patient information leaflets, and here's a they've developed over the years. We set up a, a website, um, which is still functional, again, with patient information. And this was always a research clinic. The, the goal was to understand the infection, to know what happens to people, and then to try and treat it. And so one of the first things we did was to get consent forms and, and get ethical approval for a natural history study of HGLV infection. And having run this clinic on a research basis for about 10 years, we, coinciding with the decision by the government to introduce blood donor screening, so universal blood donor screening for HGLV, we managed to persuade the Department of Health that it was time to set up a properly funded, a Department of Health funded uh, clinic. And we did that in 2004, and um, we had uh, Sir Trevor MacDonald come and open uh, our little clinic. And so we've had NHS funding uh, since then. So as I say, the first part was to really uh, look at what happens to somebody with HGLV infection, clinical observation. And it, we didn't do anything really sophisticated, 
Certainly with our patients with um, ham, who have difficulty walking, we wanted to be able to see how that changed. And so we simply timed the walk. Uh, and our corridor is 30 meters long. And so, funnily enough, the first few years, we measured time walk over 13 meters um, until we realized that everybody else was doing it over 10 meters. Um, so we adapted. But what we found was that this condition, which had been described as having a, a, an early phase where patients got worse, and then there was a plateau. But we observed that our patients were actually deteriorating year on year, and that an average patient's walking would get slower by four seconds over that 10 meters each year. We also observed that there were other inflammations in these patients, um, affecting, for example, eyes or muscle, and that our patients who had already one inflammation, such as ham, were more likely to have another inflammation, such as inflammation of the eye. And more recently, because we takes time to uh, study for long enough sufficiently large numbers of patients to, to make these observations, we've shown a link between HGLV1 and a lung condition, bronchiectasis. Now, this has been described already in Australian Aborigines with HGLV1. But this is the first time it's been described in an Afro-Caribbean population or Caucasian population, that's most of the patients we see. And... Um, and what was important about this was we, we linked it to viral load, which I'll talk about in a minute, but we also linked it with inflammation. So this was a disease that was related to inflammation due to HGLV1 uh, and not, for example, to leukemia. Measurement, measurement. So we wanted to measure the amount of HGLV infection. We wanted to measure the amount of virus in the blood. And I was very grateful to Jenny Toswell, and John Cluley, who helped uh, with the design of primers and a PCR reaction, which I won't go to in detail, but you can amplify DNA until you can detect it by fairly simple methods. And to quantify, we did something which is really quite simple, which is to repeatedly do the PCR on the sample, but dilute the sample uh, many times until you can no longer detect the, the virus that's present. And that gives you sense of how much virus is in the sample that you started with. The problem with this assay um, is that it took uh, about a day to do one sample. So it was not particularly efficient. And I did many of them. So it may not have been a very efficient use of my time either. But in 2001, we got uh, and went out and purchased um, a machine called a light cycle. And it was the second machine uh, to be delivered to the UK, and it was really exciting because this machine would do the PCR reactions and detect the uh, amount of DNA that was being created. So if you had a product there, if you had something that you could amplify and detect, the machine would look every cycle of, uh, so about every minute to see whether it was there, and that would give you a signal which you could then correlate with a standard curve and come up with a quantification of the virus. Now, the, the important thing about this for me is it took about two hours, and you could do 32 samples in one go. So that was much better. And with those technologies, initially with the, the simple PCR, nested PCR, and then with the real-time PCR, we were able to quantify HGLV1 in the blood of all the people attending the clinic. And here, um, Maria has separated out for me Patients were asymptomatic carriers and their viral load, and those who had ham, um, the myelopathy. And on the top, you'll see that there's a widespread. So I'll, the y-axis here is the frequency of the numbers of patients in each category. The x-axis is tenfold changes in viral load. So if we go from very little virus to high amounts of virus. And amongst the asymptomatic carriers, you'll see there's a widespread spread with a lot of patients uh, having less than one infected cell in 100, but some having more. But amongst those with the myelopathy, they all fit into that higher viral load category. So HGLV1 viral load was obviously important in some way, and it seemed a good idea to reduce it. Um, 
we showed that it was high, sorry, I forgot this slide, we also showed that it was stable over time. But we wanted to diminish the amount of virus because it may be that would allow some recovery or even perhaps prevent disease. And for HIV, we had drugs such as these uh, from that previous life cycle I showed you. And some of these drugs are also active against HTLV, at least in the test tube. So we took a drug which is active against both HIV and HTLV. And uh, from the, it's a reverse transcription inhibitor. And we set up a study uh, to give it to some of our patients. And this is... Uh, the title is not the, the drug, I'll come to that in a minute, but this is a, the viral load of a patient who had developed HTLV1-associated uh, myelopathy just at the end of this uh, line, the time point for the viral burden. And this is obviously, therefore, a new, new disease starting. We thought it would be good to try and treat it early, so we started with our drug Zidovidine, and you could maybe suggest that after about six months, the bowel load might be starting to go down a little bit. But the patient didn't tolerate this drug particularly well, so we switched to lamivudine, another enzyme inhibitor of the same, the same enzyme, another inhibitor of the same enzyme. And we saw a very dramatic reduction in viral burden by about uh, 99%, which is huge. Um, and we were very excited by this. You can see also that it wasn't a constant feature. There was a lot of fluctuation, very different from what we'd seen in our long-term studies. Um, and the key to this was that the patient felt better and had, uh, at that point, decided she no longer needed to use a walking stick. So we felt this was clinically important, um, this reduction of our load with a clinical improvement. So what you need to do when you've made an observation like that and tested it in a few more patients is, is to go to a randomized controlled trial with placebos, so dummy tablets, if you like. And we did this. We got MRC funding and conducted a small study. Remember, this is a rare disease. So we had 24 patients randomized to the two arms, so 12 patients per arm. And we had the active drug versus placebo, both drugs um, being given and we looked for different outcomes. Journeys have highs and lows, and this was a low because we saw no effect on the disease, no effect clinically, no effect on the immune responses, and as I'm showing in this slide, no effect on the viral burden. So although you might think there might have been a little bit of a reduction here in viral load, that occurred with the placebo as well, and there really is no significance. So if we couldn't reduce viral load, we couldn't get rid of the causative agent. The problem in these patients is inflammation, inflammation of the spinal cord. So we switched tack and looked at drugs that might inhibit the inflammation. The reason why this drug didn't work, although it works against the enzyme, was because, and I think this was already known to some extent but hadn't been quantified, not so much of this was happening, which where the drug would be active, preventing the spread and infection of new cells with HTLV-1. And quite a lot of this is happening where the cells are already infected and dividing, and the drug cannot touch that if, uh, process. So we moved to the treatment of inflammation. And we took a drug, cyclosporin A, which is used in renal transplants, to suppress the immune response so that the kidneys are not rejected. And we gave treatment with this for 48 weeks and then followed up for another 24 weeks. Again, it's a small study. It's a proof of concept rather than anything else. But we identified patients who we thought were most likely to benefit because they had early disease or were clearly progressing. And we were delighted to see that at 12 weeks, walking was improving. Pain was less. Surprised to see that there was less virus in the blood, and particularly in the CSF, although this is not an antiviral. And happy that there was a reduction in inflammation as measured by blood tests. All co you know, consistent with the fact that this drug was causing some improvement. But it's an open study, 
So there could be a placebo effect. Not everybody tolerated cyclosporin. And so for those who didn't, we switched to another immune suppressive agent, much used in treating uh, inflamed joints, methotrexate. And we've been using that um, in the clinic for some years now because it's easier to, to manage. It's a once a week tablet and requires less monitoring. And this is a look back study uh, done by one of our medical students um, showing improvement in the walking of two thirds of the patient who was started on that, associated with reduction in markers of inflammation. So what's nice about doing a look back study, despite the problems with doing look back studies, is you can actually include time points before the patient started treatment. And you can see that patients were, in fact, getting worse before they started the treatment, improved with street treatment, and then maintained an improvement. So this is part of our standard of care um, in the clinic these days. And just finally on HAM, um, this is another treatment and another look-back study where we give high doses of steroids for three days and what we found here, and I'll jump through this very quickly, is that this works well for pain, but not, has, not having much effect on walking. And the pain gets better however long you've had disease, whereas the walking doesn't improve if you've had disease for more than uh, uh, a few months or a, a couple of years at the most. So I'm going to move on to... The second of the major diseases associated with HTLV-1, which is adult T-cell leukemia. This is a rare malignancy of T-cells, T-lymphocytes in the blood, a type of white cell. And it's characterized by enlargement of glands, liver, spleen, frequently with involvement of the skin. In the blood, you get very uh, characteristic cells which have these petals and are called flower cells. And the white cell count will increase dramatically. This is a difficult disease to manage. The red lines on my chart here show how many people are still living following diagnosis um, over time. And if we take this point, this means half of all people with the disease have died. And that is occurring at about six months. And this was published in 1991 from Japan. This has recently come out. It's, again, it's a Japanese study. There's been massive improvement in chemotherapy to treat leukemias, support for that, uh, and or, you know, novel therapies and intensification of therapy. But if we look the same way, here we are, 50%, draw the line down, we're out to about eight months. So there has not been a major improvement in the treatment of this condition over 25 years. But... In the, um, in the early uh, treatment era for HIV, a patient who had HIV and HTLV developed adult T-cell leukemia. And he was AT, his ATLL was treated with interferon, an antiviral, and zidovudine, an anti-HIV inhibitor. And his ATLL got better. So two groups looked at that in further detail and published in 1995. And with um, doctors at the Royal Marsden, we also did a prospective study looking at this, these antiviral treatments um, for a malignancy. It was an observational study, but 12 of the patients had failed uh, chemotherapy. And when we treated them with the antiviral drugs, so-called, two-thirds responded, and 50% were still alive at 18 months compared to six or eight months. So we started then to introduce this very much into our management of our patients with the ATLL in conjunction with chemotherapy. And a clinical research fellow working with me a few years ago, Andrew Hodson, gathered information from across the UK. Again, this is a rare disease, so it's difficult to do prospective studies. But not everybody bought into the antiviral treatment. Not every clinical group thought that this was a good idea. So basically, by geography, determine whether you've got zidovudine interferon in addition to chemotherapy or chemotherapy alone. 
And this is a survival chart. This is the line where you have chemotherapy alone. And this is the line where you get the antivirals at some point. And you can see there's a clear separation. And about 30% uh, are still surviving at four years. So a very strong signal that this was doing something. Trying to follow what's happening in these patients requires more techniques. And one of the ones we decided to go for was coming back to our question of integration and looking at these integration sites which are identical in each cell. So if you have a leukemia, every single one of those cells is likely to have the same integration. And if we can amplify that integration site, we can get a signal which will tell us that there is one integration. So in, 90, in 2006, a summer student came to the lab and set, started to work on a system called inverse PCR. Basically, what happens there is we were amplifying this integration site. And if we only have one integration site, we have a single, these are replicates, so we have a single band at the same place on our gel. And so we know there's only one integration site. We call it monoclonal. This is from a patient with leukemia due to HGLV1. We take somebody who doesn't have HGLV1, we find they've got multiple uh, integration sites. These are clonally expanded, but they're, they're, they're multiple in different sites. So when we do our amplification, we find, come up with different bands. And you can see here many different bands in the replicates, not all aligning. So we call it polyclonal. And another student, Joe, showed that when patients were being treated and responding in the blood, we could nicely see this convert from the monoclonal pattern to the polyclonal reemergence of um, multiply infected cells as opposed to the leukemic cell. Now, Charles's group have developed this much further and using a high throughput sequencing, which I'm not going to go through the detail of, but essentially these charts not only tell us um, how many bands, but they quantify how many cells relatively are in each, uh, have the same integration site. So over here, we each whole portion of this chart is represents one clone, one viral integration site. And if it's a big slice, then there are many cells and over here, we just have a single cell. So in amongst our asymptomatic carriers, we have multiple clones, some a little larger. The same is true in patients with HAM. But when we get to the malignancies, when we get to leukemia or lymphoma, there is a dominant clone. There are some other small clones, small um, integration site. Uh, but this is really dominant. One single cell has expanded uh, and has um, completely dominating proceedings. So, We've used this to uh, see what happens in patients. So this is a patient with um, a chronic form of le leukemia, treated not with chemotherapy, but with just cytobidine and interferon. And this is the period of time that he was treated. This line here is the improvement in his white blood cell count, which normalizes. This is the amount of virus in his blood that actually stays high at around about 50% for many months, but eventually comes down to a lowish point, more akin to um, an asymptomatic carrier. And here we see the integration site. So this is the what we now call a vectorette, showing a dominant band. You see it also here. That's at baseline. Out here, two, two years into treatment, the white cell count has been normal for two years, but we still see the dominant band here and here. But at four and a half years, viral load has come down, and we, the, that dominant band has disappeared. And this patient is now off treatment, has been off treatment for about five years, and remains in complete remission. So this, at least for this patient, has predicted, um, I'm not going to say cure yet, but certainly prolonged remission. So... I've talked about a couple of the diseases related to HGLV. I've talked about epidemiology. 
In the title, again, we talked about retroviruses, ancient and modern. So the HTLVs are the ancient retroviruses. They've been in humankind for somewhere between 40 and 200,000 years. And HTLV-1, we think, arrived in humans around about 60,000 years ago. So the new kid on the block, the modern retrovi human retrovirus, is HIV. And HIV, as we know, started to show itself uh, in the early 80s. But data from Africa shown in tissue stored that HIV was present at least in 1959 uh, and 1960 in the same town. And looking at the way which viruses evolve, um, it's been estimated that HIV separated from its uh, non-human primate uh, origin as early as 1908, uh, but not before that. So it's a very young human retrovirus. And I'm just going to finish off now talking a little bit about some of the work we've been doing with HIV in pregnant women, which has been a parallel theme uh, for me. So we've known for the last 21 years that we can reduce the mother risk of mother-to-child transmission of HIV. And this study, I think, is one of the most important studies in the history of HIV treatment, at least up until uh, quite recently, because this is the study that showed that zidovidine, which keeps coming up in my talk, given to pregnant women in the second trimester and third trimester, and then given to the babies for six weeks, reduces the mother-to-child transmission of this virus by two-thirds. So we have an intervention. In 1995, I started working with my pediatric colleagues in their department, in their family clinic. So I was looking after the adults, including pregnant women. And one of the things we were disappointed to find was that HIV testing was available and it was being offered to pregnant women, but only 30% were accepting the test. But we had a treatment, but they weren't being tested, so how would we know to treat them? <coughs> so we did a survey of the patients, and we said, if you were offered an HIV test, would you accept it? And the survey came back and said, yes, at least 70% of them would. So there's something quite wrong with the way we were offering the test to our patients. So we changed things. We wrote information leaflets again. Um, we changed the wording from an offer to a recommend. We explained why this is important. We explained it was being offered to all pregnant women. And very quickly, the uptake went from 70 to 95%. And it now sits just below 100%. And we took the clinic to the patients because diagnosing HIV and then being referred to another clinic for the treatment of that was a barrier. So we took our clinic to the antenatal clinic and saw the patients there. And we set about collaborating again. And uh, a number of collaborations, the London HIV Perinatal Research Group, which um, is really a gathering of people of like mind to try and understand um, what's happening in HIV in pregnancy. There's a national study which we've contributed to, which is run from the Institute of Child Health. There's a European collaborative study. There's an international pregnancy register to which we submit data. And there's the thing called PANA, which is a pan-European uh, study, which I will mention again in a moment. So we also managed to come up with an, some guidelines and I think the start of the abstract is really quite important. The aim of anti-HIV therapy in pregnancy is to deliver a an healthy, uninfected child to a healthy mother and preserving the treatment options for the mother in the future. So we were treating mothers initially with one drug. That was not a good idea in the longer term because it doesn't completely suppress the virus. But three drugs will. Three drugs will completely suppress HIV replication in the blood. And that is also associated with reduction in transmission. And so we went from transmission rates of 20% down to 2%. And over the last few years, we've gradually increased or improved um, that. And we now have some of the uh, lowest rates reported with less than 1 in 200 babies 
are born to an HIV positive mother becoming HIV infected themselves and that rate is much much less if the mother is taking uh, treatments so it's almost a case of it's uh, sort of, well it is a rare event if a mother on treatment now transmits infection but it's not all plain sailing and uh, during the, my time in the antenatal clinic I was learning a little bit about pregnancy rather than HIV. And one day we saw a patient with preeclampsia, a condition at the end of pregnancy related to high blood pressure, which can be life-threatening. And I was quite intrigued by this. I said, oh, we don't normally see that. And Cecilia, my, the midwife that I was working with, said, yes, actually, we should be seeing it, and we haven't seen it. And that's odd. So what we actually, when we started to look at that with uh, the obstetricians, we actually found that our patients with HIV that wasn't treated, we hadn't seen any preeclampsia at all compared to the rate we would expect in the general population of pregnant women. Nor were we seeing it very much in the mothers treated with zidovidine. But once we introduced triple therapy, we believed we were restoring the immune system by treating the HIV, and that increased their rate of preeclampsia. And now whether it really goes that high is another matter. The numbers are small. But certainly there was restoration of preeclampsia. Preeclampsia is one cause of preterm delivery. And so that was another thing that we started to look at. It's been reported elsewhere, but there was a lot of debate about whether you really saw preterm delivery related to HIV therapy. So a baby that's born after 37 weeks is the term baby. Preterm baby obviously born before that. And it's a common finding. It's about 6% of all pregnancies. And that was the rate we saw in our mothers just getting the zidovidine. But once we moved to triple therapy, the rate went much higher. And it wasn't just as simple as all triple therapy. The rates were different depending on which type of drug we gave. So a protease inhibitor had a much higher rate than a, a non-nucleoside reverse transcription inhibitor. So don't worry about too much about the terms. The point is that different drugs in combination were having different effects. And this remains a debate in the literature till now do PIs, the protease inhibitors, really induce more preterm delivery? And the other thing which I think we've always felt was the case was timing of therapy may be important. So if you start the therapy before pregnancy, you may not see the effect. If you start it mid-pregnancy, then we were starting to see really quite high rates of preterm delivery compared to monotherapy started at the same time. So this is something we continue to look at and we don't have the answers yet, but we think it's likely to be immune-mediated. Finally, drugs and pregnancy. Not a good combination. All pregnant women are told not to take drugs in pregnancy. It might harm the baby. And here we are, prescribing them like they were going out of fashion. So one of the things we needed to know, are we getting the drug levels right? And we did a study of nevirapine, um, an HIV inhibitor. And we showed we were getting good levels in our um, mums. And that's at, uh, during the pregnancy, that's at delivery. The drug crossed the placenta and was found in the baby 24 hours later at high levels too. And what we also observed that if the mother was taking the levarapine and it was crossing the placenta, it had an effect on liver enzymes in the baby. So when the baby... Um, was tested after 24 hours, although the levels were still good, they had dropped off quite rapidly. Whereas if the baby hadn't been exposed in the pregnancy, this is the mother's uh, blood taken two hours after a dose of nevirapine, good levels in the, in the core blood crossing to the baby and persisting in the baby. And it can persist for 10 days at really good levels. So nevirapine crossing the, uh, the placenta was having an effect on the baby's liver function. But not harmful as far as we can see. And we looked at, we've looked at other drugs. We looked at, for example, uh, a protease inhibitor called lipinavir, where there was some concern that the levels were too low in pregnant women. But we showed that with a new formulation and some of the physiological changes of binding of that drug, uh, that no dose adjustment was required. And then we joined uh, the PANA study which is run out of Holland. And, uh, and this is the front cover of a PhD 
from Angela Colbers, which was publicly defended a couple of weeks ago, reporting that there's no dose adjustment required in pregnancy for mums taking a whole range of drugs. Um, so that's reassuring. So I come to the end of my journey. 40 years ago, I was involved in public health, I guess, um, as a gap year student, um, looking at maternal and child health in District Dehradun in North India. 40 years later, I'm still involved in uh, maternal and child health in some way, trying to make sure that HIV-infected women deliver healthy, uninfected uh, babies in the district of Paddington. And I reintroduced this uh, cartoon of a retrovirus. Uh, I thought it looked familiar. <laughs> Maybe I was destined to study these uh, viruses after all. So I finish, obviously, with my slides of uh, gratitude to many people over many years who've influenced my career. Uh, Jonathan Weber, Myra McClure, and Charles, who you've already heard we've worked with extensively, and it's been uh, a real privilege and education. There were too many names, so I'm just going to highlight groupings. My clinical teachers, I learned so much from many people across three continents about how to look after patients. I've got a fantastic team in the clinic uh, over many years now helping to look after our patients and uh, it's always fun in the clinic. Uh, also the family clinic and the antenatal clinic, great, great colleagues there teaching me about the areas I don't know anything about. My colleagues in the Department of Sexual Health at St. Mary's, the team that have uh, worked with me in the lab, so the ones who've been doing the hard work for me, along with those who taught me in the original days, and taking a clinician into the lab is not always uh, something people want to do, uh, but they, they did that, and, and I was really grateful to what they taught me. Of course, to all the people we've worked with, the researchers, the collaborators, and so much of what I've done is collaboration. The patients who are amazing um, love to take part in research. Um, 95% of our patients take part in research. Um, and, and that's how we make progress. I want to thank my family, my mum, who's here, um, my dad, who passed away last year, for their support over many years, of my wife and my two sons, and, of course, the funders. Thank you very much for listening. You have to stay here. Okay. You, have to, you have to keep standing for this. So I'm Jonathan Weaver, and welcome. And thank you, Graham, for an, an exemplary lecture, I, an exemplary inaugural. I really enjoyed every minute of it. And it's a packed house here, and I think that just says everything. So I just want to just come back to two moments in my life w which were seminal because Graham made them sort of happen. Uh, and with a tiny bit more detail than you perhaps remember or want to remember. So, so I first heard about HTLV1 1983, nine, yeah, 1983, because a, a man called Max Essex, an American virologist, published a paper saying that patients with AIDS had positive serology for HTLV1, a completely spurious paper. But it got everyone who was working on AIDS and those reading about this slightly weird virus that had just been reported. And then I went to work in an HTLV-1 lab, Robin Weiss's lab, the Institute of Cancer Research, which was then sort of morphing into an HIV lab. But still everyone was sort of, had worked on HTLV-1, all the cell lines were HTLV-1, so I, I was a bit steeped in it, although it was very peripheral. And then when I came to leave the Chester Beatty in 1988 to go set up my own group at the Hammersmith, Royal Postgraduate Medical School, I had to sit down with my lab boss, Robert Weiss, and, and with Mel Greaves from the Institute and agree what I was going to take with and what I was going to leave behind um, as an agreement. And one of the things I said was I, I really wanted to start to understand the natural history of HTLV-1. Um, Mel Greaves said to me, just mad, you're never going to get any funding to do that. So that was a challenge. So then I went to Hammersmith and um, 
I had a whole series of, of registrars there, and then when I came to Mary's, and with each one, I'd say, look, I've got a really good idea for a project. <laughs> and I'd start to explain this, and they'd say, no, I want to work on HIV. And, um, and this happened just multiple, multiple times. And so when I interviewed with Val Kitchen, Graham Taylor, who literally was in shorts and <laughs> socks and sandals straight off the plane from the Solomon Islands, in, in 1992, and said, oh, and by the way, I've got an idea for a project in HDLV1. And he said, yeah, I want to work on HDLV1. I could have hugged him. <laughs> it was such an amazing time. And um, it, it's to give you some idea of his standing internationally in, in that field. After this lecture, if you go and Google HTLV one you, you come up with about 650,000 returns. And number one is the American Society for Oncology, because they always get him big in Google and cancer. But number two is Graham Taylor and the National Center for Human Retrovirology. And I can think of no special area of expertise in, in the UK which gets that hit that high up on what is essentially a global search. That's how influential he has become. If ever there was an example of the student excelling and exceeding his teacher, this is it. So the second thing was uh, in 1999. So um, Charles Bangham runs every year uh, a series of lectures, um, the Armroth Wright Lectures, which are a very sort of meritorious lecture series around pathology. And um, in 1999, he asked Professor Mark Pepys, from, who was Professor of Medicine at UCL, to come give one of the talks. Uh, Mark is a great expert on amyloidosis and had set up a, a national center for amyloidosis that had been funded uh, by the government and was, took national referrals. And we went out for dinner that night, and I said to him over dinner, Mark, how did you get the money for amyloidosis? It's a sort of tiny sort of niche area. Who gave you this money? And he said, well, there's an organization called NSCAG, run by a very particular civil servant called Edwin, and uh, Edwin's a classicist, but he has a very particular appreciation of journals and research. And if you come up with him with a niche area uh, which requires national funding, a hyper-specialist area, and if the research is really good, and he judges it, you're likely to be able to get in. And at that time, Charles was, was really in a purple patch and was publishing in fantastically highly cited papers in the world's greatest journals. And I thought, God, we can do this. So I rang Graham, literally, I think that night, and said, I've got this great idea, but you're going to have to do it all. <laughs> and he did. And he went with the trust, because this is an NHS application, to NSCAG uh, with all of this information and created from scratch, from nothing, uh, a national service which, as you can see, has just grown and grown and thrived and thrived. And I really credit him with the ability, with the ambition, and with the stamina to, to really develop something which we can be nationally proud of, and I'm immensely proud of, and of him and what he's achieved. And finally, I just reflect, this is the only time that lecturers get to lecture to their own families. It's a very difficult lecture to give for that reason. And it's really good to see so many colleagues, so many former colleagues, and uh, uh, so many members of staff and public here. But particularly, I'd like to thank the patients with HTLV who've come here tonight. This is, this is a partnership, as Graham said many times in his lecture. Um, we, as academic researchers, particularly on these difficult diseases, require real partnership with patients and their families to make progress. And progress, as you can see, is painfully slow. Um, so I'd like to thank them particularly for everything they've done to make everything we've done possible. And I thank you most sincerely for coming here tonight. Graham, fantastic. And very good luck for all the future.